Hi, I'm Carson Ellis, and I am the author and illustrator of Do Is Talk. I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of early drawing memories. A lot of them are of drawing horses, because I was kind of a kid that loved horses. So I drew a lot of horses when I was a kid. I drew a lot of cats. I drew comic books about cats and horses. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I remember sitting outside with a sketchbook and drawing. I remember drawing at my kitchen table. I kind of just remember always drawing. I'm most proud of uh, the narrative of this book and the concept behind it. I'm proud of it. It's the second book I've written myself and illustrated, um, and the first one didn't really have as much of a narrative. It's sort of more a poem on a theme, whereas this has a story that um, has to be gotten across, and it's because of the concept of the book, um, it was sort of a hard, it was hard to figure out how to tell the story right and have it come across and be understood. And so I really had to puzzle it out. So I was proud of the idea and I was proud that I figured out the right way to tell it. Or I hope I did. I think the perfect reader for this book is children. I mean, I think, um, when I was a kid, I really loved to find myself in kind of an, an immersive world created within a book. And that was really what I was trying to do with this book, um, was to make a whole little world and an environment that the reader could kind of live inside of and get to know. And, um, and I think that, yeah, I think, I, I think kids, but probably littler kids, I have two kids, I have a two-year-old and a nine-year-old, and they both like it. So I, I think nine-year-olds could get into it too, but I think especially little kids, like you know, uh, four to six or something, or would be especially good readers for it. I had an art teacher in high school who told me that I should just keep drawing no matter what, when I asked him if he thought I could grow up to be an artist. He didn't say yes or no, which was probably a wise response. He didn't ensure me my artistic career because that would be a silly thing to do, but he told me that regardless, I should just always keep drawing and making art. Well, that book is kind of, home is um, in places meant to be sort of engaging and interactive. You know, it, there's homes, in the book that were told who lived there, we're told whose homes they are, and then there's also homes that were not told, and the text asks the reader who they think lives there. So um, I don't know, that's the funnest part of reading the book to kids, especially big groups of kids, because they all have strong opinions about who they think lives in those homes, and especially the third home, which is uh, supposed to be sort of like a terraformed planet. It's like a um, like a Victorian mansion underneath like a geodesic dome on another planet. And that's how I always think that's pretty clear and that's going to come across immediately. But, but so many kids think Santa lives there. <laughs> kids always raise their hand and say it's Santa's home, which I think is so sweet and wonderful. And now whenever I think of Santa in the North Pole, I think of him in that weird house. <laughs> It just seemed like when I was writing the book that the bugs shouldn't speak English because they're bugs, they just wouldn't. And it seemed more fun to give them their own language. And I think it, I made up the words pretty quickly, but then I kind of went back and revised some of them. I knew it would be kind of a silly and awkward thing for grown-ups to read out loud because it's a lot of gibberish, you know, it's a lot of invented words, but I wanted them to be fun words to say. So I read it out loud a lot to myself and noted the places where I was like, oh, I don't like saying that word. Like, replace it with another word. They're all made up <laughs> anyway. Um, so it was, it was partly uh, just trying to find words that were fun to say, since you're, it'll be read aloud a lot. And then also trying to find words that, not that, um, but that corresponded in some way, some feeling or something, not linguistically, but just um, some way or another to the thing they were describing so kids can sort of intuit what the bugs are talking about. Um, like for example, there's a page where the bugs say, we should build a fort. 
And they say, originally, they, in bug language, that translated to Ru Dadin Dudent Ankh Budalantri. <laughs> that was how you said that. And I showed it to my sister in law, and she said, I don't think the word Bodalantri sounds like a fort. And I said, does fert sound like a fort? And she said, yes. <laughs> so I changed it. So I was trying to make it sound, I wanted the language to kind of read as um, believable as a language, but as a made up language. They follow like a really, really simplified sentence structure of say the English language. There's typically, you can, you can translate it. The book is translatable if you really want to try. And I think through context and repeated words and stuff, if you really, really wanted to, you could figure out what they were saying. But, um, you know, do is talk means what is that? And um, uh, every, you know, most of the sentences, if it, they're proper sentences in the book, they do start with um, a pronoun and then a verb and then a noun or a pronoun and then a verb. They, they follow English sentence structure, but it's very, very simplified. I wanted it to be like a little bit intuitable. You know, I didn't want it to be impossible to figure out what they were saying, though I don't think it's crucial. I don't think it's critical that you can figure out what the bugs are saying. Obviously, most people won't. It's kind of a handful to try to go through and really try to translate it. But at the same time, I wanted it to make sense and be readable.